very much. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks very much to the organizers for inviting me. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here. Um, so everything I talk about today is joint work with Takashi Taniguchi. The, the sort of main object of study for today's talk is the family of elliptic curves. So let me tell you what I mean by that. So every elliptic curve over Q can be written uniquely in the form y squared equals x cubed plus ax plus b, where a and b are integers. And to, and to make sure that this way of writing elliptic curves is unique, you also have to assume that p to the 4 dividing a implies p to the 6 does not divide b for all primes p. And then you can construct your family of all elliptic curves to be all EAB. So we'll call this elliptic curve EAB. Um, and here, of course, like uh, A and B need to satisfy the same conditions. And additionally, this cubic polynomial needs to have this distinct root. So we also need 4A cubed plus 27B squared not equal to zero. So and above conditions. Now, we know that given an elliptic curve, you have a rank that's associated to it. And of course, the study of ranks of elliptic curves is a very deep and uh, important topic. But today, we're going to be studying what happens to the rank uh, and to other arithmetic invariants of elliptic curves as we vary over elliptic curves in this family. And the main conjecture which motivates this this topic in arithmetic statistics is a conjecture which is due to the works of Goldfeld and Kat Sarnak. And the conjecture says that 50% of elliptic curves in our family have rank zero. 50% have rank one, and the, the average rank of elliptic curves in our family is a half, which is to say that the 0% of elliptic curves with rank which are not zero or one don't actually affect the average very much. Now, when I make any kind of statement like this, any kind of statistical statement like 50% have rank zero or average rank is a half, I need to order my elliptic curves in a, in a certain way because it's an infinite set of elliptic curves. And what, like we, what we would like to do, of course, is order elliptic curves by conductor or order elliptic curves by discriminant, but that turns out to be a little bit too difficult to do. So instead, we will order elliptic curves by height. Uh, so when these elliptic curves are ordered by height with a height of EAB is the maximum of 4A cubed and 27B squared. The 4 and the 27 here are not important. It's here so that it kind of mimics the discriminant in certain ways. And, and we do expect this conjecture to be true under almost any natural ordering. We expect it to be true when you order by conductor, when you order by discriminant, when you order by height. Uh, today, we're going, to be order, we're going to be ordering elliptic curves um, by height. OK. So the way we study ranks of elliptic curves Curves, uh, algebraic ranks of elliptic curves is frequently uh, via their two Selmer groups. So let me tell, tell you what this two Selmer groups 
of elliptic curves are. So, so instead of giving you a, a sort of a definition of it, I'll just tell you the exact sequence they fit into because that will explain why they tell us something about the height. So if, if E is an elliptic curve over Q, then there's an exact sequence, zero goes to EQ mod two EQ, which injects into the two Selmer group of E, which surjects onto the two torsion in the state Shafevich group of E. So this is uh, this is a nice this is a nice exact sequence. It's particularly nice because uh, the two Selma group here is is finite and it's a very important quantity. So for example, models prove that the ranks of elliptic curves are bounded. Basically, in secret is a proof that the two Selma group of an elliptic curve is finite. Now there's a there's there's a Cohen Lenstra style heuristic given by Poonen and Reigns, which predicts uh, which predicts the distribution of the two Selma groups of elliptic curves. And in fact, it predicts the distribution of the P Selma group of elliptic curves for all primes P. And in fact, there's a, a heuristic of Delaunay, which which predicts the distribution of the two torsion uh, two torsion of the Tate Shafirovich group, and it it all sort of matches together. So you've got your Cat Sanak, you've got your Cat Sanak, uh, your Goldfeld Cat Sanak heuristic, which will tell you how E of Q mod two E of Q is distributed. Namely, fifty percent of them have are trivial. Fifty percent of them is Z mod two Z. You've got the Poonen range heuristics that tells you how the two Selma group is distributed, and you've also got Delaunay's conjectures telling you how the two torsion in the Tate Shafirovich group is distributed, and, and everything sort of fits together nicely. So we have a very good picture of how this behaves. And in fact, there's a this sort of very beautiful work of of um, of Bhargava, Poonen, Reigns, Kane, uh, uh, in, and, and Lenstra, in which they 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 predict how this this entire exact sequence is distributed as the curves vary over over a family f. And so, given that we have all these different conjectures that are made in very different ways, so for example, the the the, the Katz Anna conjectures are made by studying the family of L functions associated to elliptic curves in conjunction with the BSD conjecture. Well, the Poon and Reigns heuristics are very much a sort of Cohen Lenstra style heuristic that sort of model the two Selma group as, as a random group. Um, and the fact that they all fit together is very strong evidence to believe that these conjectures are true. Um, but what does the data tell us? So the data, I'm afraid, is not particularly satisfying. It had been noticed when people looked at the Cremona tables, the ranks of elliptic curves were significantly higher than the goldfeld katz sanak conjecture would, would uh, predict for them. They seem to be a particularly high percentage of rank two curves. They seem to, the average rank, rank seem to be bigger than one in the data and so on and so forth. But the Cremona tables didn't have all that much data because the because Kremena ordered elliptic curves by conductor and it's actually very difficult to even know that you've listed out every single elliptic curve of a given conductor. It's computationally quite expensive. However, recently, this work of Balakrishnan, Ho, Kaplan, Stein, Spicer, and Weigand, who collect a very large amount of data um, on elliptic curves when they're ordered by height. So in particular, they can go up to height as large as 10, 10 to the 10.5, and they still see a much larger average rank than predicted. So 
So even in this very large height range, the average rank looks more like 0.97 or something like that than the one by two that it's supposed to be. But very curiously, they also see the average size of the two Selma group. This looks smaller than predicted. So it looks like 2.7 in their top height range, which is which is smaller than 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 the three that it's supposed to be. So you have your exact sequence. This average looks much bigger than predicted, and this average looks much smaller. And this is actually, I mean, this is obviously just a feature of the data because the average size of the two Selma group has in fact been computed, and it's a result of Manjul Bhargava and myself. That the average size of the two Selma group of elliptic curves when they're ordered by height is three. So it is what it's supposed to be. And that this 2.7 in the data is, I mean, it's it's smaller for some reason that 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 needs some explanation. And the purpose of this, the main result for this talk is a possible explanation for why the average size of the two Selma group looks much smaller. It's because of the existence of a secondary term. So this is the main result I'll be talking about, and it's due to Taniguchi and myself. And what we prove is that if you sum over elliptic curves in our family of all elliptic curves, and we sum over those with height less than x, and we sum the size of the two Selma group, then this grows like three times the number of elliptic curves with height less than x. So that's in accordance, of course, with uh, the result of Manjul and, and mine. But there is, in fact, a secondary term. There's some constant times x to the 3 over 4, along with an error term, uh, along with the power-saving error term. So some delta greater than 0. OK, so I mean, just to orient ourselves, this, this term, the main term, the number of elliptic curves with height less than x, you're basically counting a cubed less than x and b squared less than x. So there should be an x to the, there should be about an x to the one by three plus one by two of them. So this grows like an x to the five by six. And this grows like an x to the three by four. So if you sum up two Selma groups with elliptic curves, the first term is a three times some constant times x to the five by six. Well, the second term is some constant times x to the three by four. And I say this is a possible explanation of why elliptic curves have, um, of why, or, or this is a possible explanation of what's going on with the data, because for the moment we are not actually able to const, we are not actually able to compute what this constant c is. We can only prove that that it exists. Uh, we would expect it to be negative. We can't even prove that it's negative. But we have some theoretic, theoretical evidence that it is that it is negative, and and so far that's that's the best that we can. Okay. Uh, sorry, I should I guess monitor chat to see if there are any questions, uh, but not yet. Great. Okay. So before I dive into the into how this result is proved. I, I want to talk about I want to talk about why we care about secondary terms in arithmetic second in arithmetic statistics. So one reason to care about secondary terms is that they are necessary.
for good error terms. So for, so for example, the, the result of, 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 of Bhargava and myself in which we compute the first term, the error term there was just a little low of x to the five by six and Takashi and my result, it's the first power saving that we, that we have for the, for the count of two Selma groups of elliptic curves. And, and okay, so the main term grows like an x to the five by six. And note that if you want a power saving error term that's better than an x to the three by four, then you are then you automatically need to get a secondary term. You're not actually going to prove a power saving term of better than x to the three by four unless you also recover the second order. Term. So if, if if you want really good error terms, then you need to to isolate the secondary term. And 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 good error terms are are in fact necessary to, for example, study. Families of L functions that you might associate with this. So, for example, the cat sanak heuristic um, is 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 obtained by studying. Families of L functions associated to elliptic curves. And what they predict is that the low-lying zeros of this family has an orthogonal distribution. And that has been proven for test functions of certain support. And those results, in fact, give you bounds on the average analytic rank of elliptic curves. So they're very useful results. But suppose you want to, for example, study families of elliptic curves, which are weighted by their two Selma groups. And you want to understand how you want to try and prove something about how the two Selma group is distributed along with how the analytic rank is distributed. So like one of the consequences of Kuhn and Reims, for example, is that if you take the average size, if you take the distribution of two Selma groups and you restrict to elliptic curves having rank zero, or you restrict to elliptic curves having rank one, and there should be about 50% of each, the distribution doesn't really change. And if you want to prove things of that sort, then what you have to do is you have to study families of L functions of elliptic curves, but you'd weight each elliptic curve by the size of the two Selma group, and you have to prove some result about that family of L functions. And you can't do that without power saving error terms. And so our result, for example, will imply that that, that family also satisfies Sartre-Tate equidistribution of um, uh, the, the family of L functions will satisfy Sartre-Tate equidistribution. So that's one reason for why you might care about secondary terms. Namely, good power saving error terms, which are also important for other things. So another reason why you care about secondary terms is secondary terms are really needed to align the theory with the data. So it's the sort of nature of arithmetic statistics is that we have a very wide ranging set of conjectures and we haven't proven very many of them. So we know how class groups of number fields are expected to be distributed. We know how Selma groups of elliptic curves are expected to be distributed. We have a whole bunch of things that we very strongly believe are true. Uh, proving them is a much slower endeavor. And if we want to be sure that our conjectures are actually correct, then we, and, and we want to get evidence from data, then we're going to need to understand how second order terms look like, because otherwise you're just not going to be able to match, uh, to match the data with the prediction. So for example, even, even in, in, in our case, even in the height range, H around 10 to the 12, the first order term looks like a 10 to the 10, and the second order term looks like a 10 to the 9, and there's a factor of 10 between them. So if you really want to see good convergence to the predicted answers, you need to know what the second order term is. 
a very nice example of this showed up also in the family of cubic fields. So the classical Davenport and Heilbronn theorem says that the number of cubic fields with discriminant less than x grows like an x divided by 3 zeta 3. But the fit with the data was really bad. They just seem to be far fewer cubic fields than this theorem would predict. And Roberts conjectured that in fact, this count is, is an x divided by 3 zeta 3 plus some constant, which, he's, which he actually wrote down explicitly, some constant times x to the power 5 by 6, along with an error term. And, and, this, conjecture, and this conjecture has been proven jointly uh, by, by sort of independent work of of uh, Bhargava, myself, and Simmerman. And so independently by also by work of Taniguchi and Thon. The point is that once you plot the data against not just the main term, but the sum of the main and the second main terms, then you get a perfect this is absolutely no doubt when you look at the data that it's that it's correct. So it fits quite wonderfully. Um, a third a third reason you might care about secondary terms is that they often have theoretical significance. Put a question mark because actually secondary terms are nowhere near as well understood in arithmetic statistics as primary terms. Uh, for primary terms, we have conjectures for a whole bunch of families of arithmetic objects. Like we we have the cohen lenstra heuristics that tell us what the primary terms of summing up any torsion subgroup of a class group of some fixed degree number field should be uh, should grow like. We have primary terms for the number of number fields of fixed Galois group with discriminant up to x. We have primary terms if you want to sum up Selmer groups of elliptic curves. And we don't really have an understanding of what secondary terms should be like, but, but we do expect them to have theoretical meaning. Some of this theoretical meaning can be seen in the function field setting. Where there's some speculation that second order terms could correspond to secondary homological stability in the sense of Galatius, uh, Coopers, and 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 um, Randall Williams. Um, but I'm I'm going to talk about a very nice source of secondary terms in arithmetic statistics that come from pre-homogeneous vector spaces. So, so let me give you an example of, of what happened in the pre-homogeneous vector space case. So if you look at if you look at the representation of GL2 on the set of integral binary cubic forms.
which I'll call V3 of Z. So this representation is pre-homogeneous, which means that there is a unique, uh, that the, the, the ring of polynomial invariance is generated by a single element. which I'll call delta, generated by the discriminant. So there's a result of Davenport, which counts the number of GL2Z orbits on integral binary cubic forms with discriminant less than x. And this result of Davenport says that this grows like 3 zeta 2 times x. And this result was generalized by Shintani. So to tell you what Shintani's generalization is, uh, let me define for you what the Shintani zeta function is in this case. So given any n, we let hn be the number of GL2z orbits on integral binary cubic forms having discriminant equals n. And then you can put all these numbers h, n together into a zeta function. So you define the Shintani zeta function to just be summation h, n divided by n to the s. And what Shintani proved is that the zeta function has an analytic continuation to the whole, whole complex plane along with the functional equation. And it has poles at s equals 1 and 5 by 6. And as a consequence, he was able to prove that when you count the number of GL2Z orbits on binary cubic forms with say zero less than um, the discriminant less than X, then this grows like the same constant the Davenport got obviously times X. along with a certain constant times x to the 5 by 6 and our saving error term. And so this secondary order term corresponds, of course, to the pole of, the, of this Shintani zero function zeta function that's naturally associated to any pre-homogeneous vector space. And in fact, there is a general theory of Sato and Shintani, which says that if you take any pre-homogeneous vector space, so, so what do I mean by that? I mean, you take a reductive group G, and you take a representation, an irreducible representation, W of G, which is pre-homogeneous. And what it means to be pre-homogeneous is that the ring of polynomial invariance is generated by a single element. Then exactly as Shintani did in the case of binary cubic forms, you can make a Shintani zeta function associated to this representation. And this general theory of Sato and Shintani proves that, that, this, that this zeta function has a functional equation and, and analytic continuation. And they also prove that, that there are just finitely many possible poles for this zeta function. And they, and they show that the poles are contained inside the set of zeros of the bernstein sato polynomial associated with the discriminant function. 
and so that's a very satisfying theory you get given any given these given any pre homogeneous representation, you get the zeta function, and then you get a whole bunch of possible poles of the Bernstein zeta polynomial. This again doesn't mean that you can you can say what the poles are, for example. So there's still there's still many open questions around here. So for example, I'll just give you a pre homogeneous vector space uh, that corresponds to quintic fields. So if you take pairs of four alternating five by five matrices. Uh, and this is a representation of the group GL4Z cross SL5Z. Then it is, then again, this is a pre-homogeneous vector space. So the Shintani zero function has an analytic continuation of functional equation, but the possible poles There are a whole bunch of possible poles. I mean, they correspond to these zeros of the Bernstein of the Bernstein Sado polynomial. This Bernstein Sado polynomial was computed by work of Kashiwara, Kimura, Kawai, and Sato. And the possible poles were there were a whole. So I'm going to miss some of them, but it's four by three. There was a ten by nine. Uh, one is a possible pole. Uh, nine by ten. Five by six. I think I missed a seven by six. Whole bunch of possible poles. And then there was work of Cable and Yuki, which said that these are not actually poles, that these three don't actually occur as poles. And then there's work of Bhargava. Which says that one is a pole. He proves that one is a pole and computes the residue at one. But there's still a question mark on the remaining ones and answering which remaining possibilities are poles will give you higher, will give you lower order terms in the counting function in this vector space. So like if you can compute the secondary term and counting this stuff, you'll know whether or not nine by 10 is a pole of this pre-homogeneous, of the zero function associated with this pre-homogeneous. Okay. okay. So now let, let me talk about our situation. So remember, we are trying to, we are, we are looking at two Selmer groups, we're looking at elements in the two Selmer groups of elliptic curves. And I told you previously that secondary terms are known for the family of cubic fields. And the way the secondary term was computed for the family of cubic fields is the set of cubic fields injects into the set of GL2Z orbits on integral binary cubic forms. And secondary terms for counting these orbits were determined by Shintani, and so that should correspond to secondary terms in counting cubic fields. And similarly, if you take the set of all two Selma elements in elliptic curves, this doesn't quite inject, but it is related to the representation uh, of PGL2Z on integral binary quartic forms. Now, this representation is not pre-homogeneous, but it's the next best thing. It's a co-regular representation. So if I look at the ring of invariance for the action of PGL2Z on the space of integral binary quartic forms, then it's generated by two elements, which I'll call A and B, where A is a degree two polynomial 
and b is a degree three polynomial on the coefficients of binary quartic forms. And the way there's a relation between the two Selmer group of an elliptic curve E and orbits of this representation is that if I take the two Selmer group of the elliptic curve EAB, then this is going to be, you can write this as a sum over PGL2Z orbits on integral binary quartic forms with invariants equal to A and B. But you have to weigh this F by a certain weight function. Okay. So, Harold? just as, yeah. Sorry, ah. not for interrupting you, please. I mean, there is a question in the chat. Um, Apiram, would you like to unmute and ask the weight? Yes, 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 absolutely. It's a great question. Thank you. Um, yes, indeed. So, so the way, so, 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 the, so the way this works is that there's a sort of by the, I think the name, but it's sort of very well known and analytic number theory that when you have a zeta function, so, so, so how, so, so the, so the Sato Shintani zeta function associated to a pre-homogeneous vector space is taking the number of orbits with a given discriminant and then putting all of that together into a zeta function. Now you have, on the one hand, the question of, can I count the number of orbits having bounded discriminant? And on the other hand, you have the question of, what are the analytic properties of the zeta function? And those two questions are very closely related. So for example, the fact that these three are not poles and that one is a pole, says that if you count the number of these orbits with discriminant less than x, then the leading term is an x, which is in fact what Bhargava proved. And if, for example, 4 by 3 was a pole, then the leading term would grow like an x to the 4 by 3, not like an x. Does that, does that answer the question? Yes, yes, thank you. Yeah. Great, thank you. Abel and Yuki gave an upper bound of uh, uh, smaller than x to the fourth, uh, 10 ninth. Yes. How did they discount? That's what they did. Okay. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. So I should say also that, that Bhargava's result uh, which 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 implies the which implies that one is a pole and which computes a residue. Uh, Bhargava used that to give asymptotics, of course, for the number of uh, GZ orbits on on WZ with bounded discriminant. He also and and then he he also did a sieve like together with his work parameterizing quintic rings. He also he managed to actually prove that that the number of quintic fields with discriminant less than x grows like x, which is sort of huge result in, in arithmetic statistics. So, so I mean, this, this result, which, which he proved in conjunction with his higher composition laws result, parameterizing quintic rings, was what was with the two ingredients that went into counting quintic fields. OK. So, so we've got so just like just like the family of cubic fields was associated to the to orbits on binary cubic forms, the family of two Selmer elements of elliptic curves associated to PGL two Z orbits on binary quartic forms. Now there's an issue with trying to evaluate. So 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 obviously. So, I mean, like, just as the first step for getting a secondary term for cubic fields was Shintani's result getting a secondary term for uh, gl to z orbits and binary cubic forms. Uh, I mean, the sort of natural first thing to do when counting, when you're trying to count, when, if you're trying to get a secondary term for counting two cell elements of elliptic curves, is to get a secondary term in counting pgl to z orbits on binary quartic forms. And, and this, this we do. So... 
um, this is a result of again mine with uh, Takashi, in which we prove that if you count PGL2Z orbits on binary quartic forms with height less than x, and what's the height on binary quartic forms? Well, I mean, it's the same height that you put on elliptic curves, max of 4a cubed and 27b squared. Right? Given a binary quadratic form, you have two invariants A and B associated to it, and, and so you make the natural height. Uh, and, and, and so what we prove is that if you count this, you get a certain constant times x to the 5 by 6. And uh, the primary term of this was proven by uh, myself and Manjul Bhargava. But we prove that there is, in fact, a secondary constant associated to it. Sorry, I'm running out of... I think I've used C for every single indeterminate constant so far, but um, but let me let me continue doing that. And we can prove that this constant C two prime is less than zero. We can give some sort of explicit description of C two prime, and it is negative. It's a negative secondary term. Okay, so we can count binary quadric forms with two main terms. And we want to go from there to counting two Selma elements in elliptic curves with two, with two main terms. But here's where uh, things get very different from the case of, of, uh, of cubic fields. So, so to prove our main result, We need to prove an analog of this result, except instead of just counting binary quadratic forms, you have to weigh them by this function W of f. And things aren't that bad, so this also happens in the cubic case, but W of f is a local is a local function. So it's a product over all p, W p of f, where W p is just defined on V z p. However, and this is very different from it. So cubic case also you had some work. cubic case the corresponding local thing was defined mod p squared so here wp is not defined mod p to the k for any k it's genuinely just some function on zp so we need a bunch of ingredients. So first, we want to write WP as a sum. So we write WP as a sum over all little k, WP of k, where WPK is defined mod p to the 2k. And secondly, wpk is sparse. Which is to say, wpk is supported on forms whose discriminants are highly divisible by p. So, so the first thing that we do is we write our weight function as a sum of 
functions, each of which are periodic and which are also increasingly sparse. And we do this by, we do this essentially by uh, interpreting WP as sort of counting nodes uh, in the Bruhartet tree of PGL2. So once we have this, then what we want to do is sum over PGL2Z orbits on integral binary quadric forms. We have to sum, um, what we want to do is sum W of F, but we've shown that W of F is just a summation over N, uh, WN of F, where Wn of f is simply product over p to the k dividing n wpk of f. So we have to sum, we have to sum a weight function. We've broken up the weight function in this way. And each Wn is supported on forms where n squared divides the discriminant of f. So it's an increasingly sparse set. And of course, to count this, we just use some, we just use like standard, like, like this is sort of very familiar from Civ theory. We break this up as n small. And we count this using equidistribution techniques. And then for n large, we have to prove a uniformity estimate. So for n small, we count using equidistribution techniques. And for n large, we just bound it. Uh, with some sort of tail estimate. And that's how the result is proven. So I think I'm out of time, 50 minutes being passed. So I'll stop now for questions.